up. Richards is at the high point. Jones, Romotario has a lane. Nicholas Romotario, the shot. Scores! Holy jumping! The Italian Stallion puts the puck in the back of the net. Mamma mia, Nicholas Romotario! Short-handed, two on one. Kirsten has Nixon. Scores! Holy jumping! It's a short-handed goal, and the Oakville Blades are running away with this one. Josh Nixon. McDermott to Israel's to McDermott. McDermott down low, centering. Scores! Mamma mia! What a goal! Kyle Potts. Puts the puck in the back of the net in back-to-back -back nights. Tic-tac-toe. And the blades passing comes to perfection. Block that shot. And coming the other way is Alton McDermott. He's in on the breakaway. Scores! Holy jumping! His grandfather, Paul Henderson, must be ecstatic about that one. Because Alton McDermott just scored his first career Buckland Cup final playoff goal. You're watching Mamma Mia! This is Fire Talk with Nicholas Fiore. Welcome back, everybody, to episode number eight of Mamma Mia! This is Fire Talk. I'm Nicholas Fiore, the Oakville Blades play-by-play -play broadcaster, and joining me on this episode is former NHLer of 557 games, three years in Germany, and also one year in Austria, Craig Johnson. Obviously, like to be called CJ. And CJ, thank you for joining uh, myself. I know you have a busy schedule, and I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Awesome. And obviously, now you're currently the player development, one of the player development staff members for the Los Angeles Kings. I believe it's your third year. Um, talk about why you wanted to uh, get involved with the organization. Um, no, number one, I, I, I love the game so much and any, any time you can, you can give back in any way. That's, that's what you're trying to do. Um, the, the people in LA are great too, to work with. Um, you go into anything and you want to learn first and foremost, you know, you, you go in, you, you want to learn to try to get better as a, as an individual. And that, that helps you do that. And it also helps you to, uh, kind of see the game a little bit differently and try to help guys. And, and, you know, there's, there's different ways in player development that we help. We, we work on skating, we'll work on edges, we'll work on different turns, you know, how they're, how they're setting their hips into the turns, different things like that. We'll, um, we might work on shooting. And then there's little things. We'll break down games, we'll look at their, their video, and it might be just little things, whether it be head checks or whether it be, you know, the angles they're taking to, to go attack or where their stick positions is or, or how their wall play is. So little things to help guys that, that can help their careers and get them better. And, you know, as, as you talked about, I, I played, a, played a while in the league and, you know, you learn, you learn things along the way and then you learn things also just, just through the coaching side. So um, I, I thought it would be after I was done and I had coached my son a while, I wanted to get back involved in uh, hockey and I, I was given the opportunity by the LA Kings. I'm very thankful for that. And I've, I've enjoyed every minute of it. Well, obviously, 10 years in the NHL, right? 10 seasons with St. Louis, L.A., Anaheim, Toronto, and Washington. Uh, three years in Germany, one in Austria. And I believe also one in the AHL or a few games in the AHL. So all, with all this experience, including playing in the Olympics and the World Championships, what, what you know, do you bring, obviously, to the table with L.A. under an impressive uh, staff roster anyways there? Well, I, I think a lot of what player development is, is it's helping guys get ready to, to start their own pro careers. And a lot of them, um, you know, a lot of them, they, they come in and they're, they are seasoned, they are ready to go, but a lot of them have little things that they need to work on. And, you know, it could be the mental side, it could be the uh, physical side. And we're there kind of to help them, to give them a different, uh, I guess, shoulder to lean on. You know, sometimes when, when you get involved with the coaching staff or whatever, it's, it's a lot of X's and O's. And this, this is a little bit different. We can, we can sit back, we can talk to them, we can communicate better with them. And, and um, I, I think just in, in general, you, you know, anytime you have somebody that's gone through it 
And, and, you know, when you look at different guys that go through their NHL careers, you know, we, we always think of the, uh, you know, the Doug Gilmore's I'm looking at your shirt in the back or, yeah. you know, <laughs> the Matt Sedin or, you know, guys, guys that have had a lot of success, but there's guys that have gone through the league too, and they found different ways to get through. You know, for myself, I, I, I would have loved to have been a scorer. I would have loved to play on the first line, but I found a way that, you know, I became a checking forward. I, I learned to kill penalties. And, you know, I, I found a way to, 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 you know, kind of to, you know, to chisel out a career in the NHL. So I, I think um, when you go into development, obviously you can't have all first line players. So we're working with guys. We're trying to, we're trying to make our seventh rounders, you know, let them play NHL games. We're trying to trying to help everybody get better so that they can have good careers. Well, you know, I agree with you 100% because I spoke with um, another former NHL, I'm sure you know well, Jamie Allison, um, earlier uh, in the show. And um, and he was the same way. He was a checking forward. He worked his, his uh, behind off to stay in the league. And it's not just all about, you know, uh, as I spoke to Matt Luff as well, who plays with LA now and the farm system there as well. It's not about always – economic things that are going to just be natural. It's got to be hard work and you got to be determined in order to get to the next level. And obviously that's where you and your staff are at right now to be determined in order to get these kids, the six, seven rounders into first, second lines. Yeah, it's, you know, you, you brought up Matt Luff and Matt Luff's a, he's, he's a great, great hockey player. Yeah. He's got an unbelievable shot, good vision. He, he moves well on the ice and, you know, it's trying to help guys like that find a way to uh, become full-time NHLers. And that's, that's, that's basically what we're trying to do. Um, obviously, we've all been through this uh, global pandemic called uh, coronavirus, but you have your family, your three kids. Uh, how has it been? Uh, are you guys sick of each other yet? <laughs> Is, are the heads, are the hair giving off of everyone? But how have you been and uh, what, what's the stages like now in L.A.? Yeah, it, it's uh, obviously it, it, it hit everybody kind of like a smack in the face. And all of a sudden the season was shut down. Everything was, you know, kind of put on pause. And for us, I had, I had one son and he was at the University of Minnesota. I have two that are still in California. One's in high school, one's in college. So what happened is as soon as, the, as, soon as it came, we brought our son um, back from Minnesota. And, you know, my wife and I were talking, I think we had at one time, we had 60 straight days where we had family dinners. So, you know, when you look at the positives in anything, that, that was one of the positives in this and that, uh, you know, this might be the last chance where we get all three kids home. And, you know, I have a 21 year old, almost 22. I got an 18 year old and a 17 year old. So we're, we're sitting here and we're, we're saying, you know what, this is, this was actually a good time for us. Obviously, uh, you hate to hear, see this happen. You know, people have been affected. We've been affected. And, um, yeah, it's, uh, I'm, I'm ready for it to end. But at the same time, uh, I always try to look at positives in anything. And that was, that was one of them. And, you know, we sat at home, and I think we started our first, uh, first few weeks. It was uh, the last dance was playing, so we played a lot of basketball. Then we went into tennis, and now, now we're go. into ping pong. So <laughs> There we go. We're, finding ways and and then you know we're working out too my my son he's uh he's at the university of minnesota he plays hockey so i've been doing his weight program with him we've been getting on the ice lately um you know we're, we're trying to find ways for him to get better too so yeah. um that that's been that's that's been the blessing and and uh but we are everybody's ready to get back to normal and unfortunately uh as you guys can probably see up in Canada, the, the numbers in California are starting to spike a little bit and yeah. we're trying to do our part. We're wearing our masks. We're, we're practicing our social distancing. We're, you know, we're, we're trying to, trying to be the best and we're hoping everybody else can too. And the numbers can come down. Yeah. We want to, we want to get back on the ice here. I know with uh, Jamie Storr and Leopold Blades, we had a chance of maybe repeating our championship in uh, the OJHL, but obviously the season had to be halted because of, all of this, how, how is the return to play right now in like USA hockey and in maybe like the uh, junior systems there or, or is it basically the status quo? Um, it, it's state by state here. So certain states are back and from what I've, I, I don't know this for sure, but I've, I've heard that tournaments are now being held in, in the states and some of the states, but um, 
there's there are some camps um, in California. We have a uh, return to play, I guess, return to hockey protocol that we're following. Um, up right now, it's uh, 25 players on the ice, and it uh, it doesn't allow scrimmaging three on three, any contact. It's more um, everybody has to be socially distanced, and it's more skill work based. So that's that's where California is now. That's where it should be. I, yeah. I guess there might be a few rinks that are going opposite, but but that's that's what the government passed, and that's what most rinks are doing now. Um, let's talk about your time with you know the USA national team. Obviously, World Championships uh, are held normally every summer for the most part um, in various uh, cities and countries. But the Olympics, that's always something pretty cool uh, to play. And I mean, I watched it. I watch it all the time. Uh, even when the NHL players didn't go, I was still cheering for Canada, right? Um, how was that experience? And uh, is, it, is it really anything like wearing uh, your chest, crest on your chest? Uh, it, was, it was an incredible experience. I, you know, I, when, you, when you look back, obviously, I, I'm American. So you, I, was, I was eight years old when they won the uh, gold medal in, in 80. And, you know, looking back, you, you always wanted to play and wear the uh, – you know, wear that crest and, you know, getting the opportunity, being part of the national program for a whole season where we, we trained together, we traveled together, we together, we got together, we got there, we got to play, whether it be team Canada, we played in tournaments over overseas. We played uh, exhibitions against NHL teams, AHL teams. And it was, it was a phenomenal experience. Um, walking, walking into the opening ceremonies, you know, I was I was watching on TV, whether it be the summer or winter Olympics and watching these athletes come in and then realizing you're part of that was really special. And, you know, just just the whole um, the whole atmosphere of the Olympics. I remember sitting in the first uh, first day I was there. We had kind of a common room where all the athletes could uh, kind of mingle and, you know, grab a grab a water, or, you know, snack or whatever it was. And I was in there and I'm sitting, it was just myself and a guy walks in and he sits down and we start talking and I go, Oh, do you compete? He goes, yeah, because I'm a skier. And I'm like, Oh, have you competed yet? And he goes, yeah, I actually competed today. I go, well, how'd you do? And he goes, well, I won the gold. It was, uh, it ended up being Tom, ended up being Tommy Moe. So I talked to him for quite a while and we had a, we had a good talk and, but that's, that's what you're, you know, that's, <laughs> that was kind of the, uh, you know, the athletes that you're around and then the whole thing with Tanya Harding and Nancy Kerrigan that was going on at that time too. So, yeah, um, yeah it was a great experience. I, I loved it and love wearing the American crest too. Let's uh, switch uh, to switch. the difference um, of leagues and with the NHL and then obviously going to Europe, right? Three years in Germany, one year in Austria. Is the game maybe then and now that different from the National Hockey League to uh, European hockey? Um, yeah, it's it's quite a bit different. The the speed of the game, the um, you know the size, the physicality of the players in in the NHL is you know the NHL is the best of the best. Um, you know, I, I talked about it. I, I kind of touched on it earlier. You have different roles, so. When all of a sudden your role is to, you know, go over to Europe and play in Germany, all of a sudden you're getting a little bit of power play time and you're, you're playing a little bit different role than you were. It, it, was, it was fun. It was, it was a great experience. I went over during the lockout and, you know, the intention was to go over for, you know, that season because they had canceled the NHL season and then come back the next year. Well, sometimes it doesn't work out that way. And I ended up staying for three years, retired, and then, Got a call, and I went back my last year and played in uh, Austria in Salzburg. And obviously, you know Jamie Storwell, um, the Oakville Blades head coach. Played with him in L.A. for several years. Um, and then obviously, you someone recruited him to, to Europe, and you guys played together there. Um, talk about that relationship. Uh, J Jamie has been a uh, great friend. You know, I, I think every every year I was in LA, he was he was with us, so we got to know each other very well. Um, and then going over to Germany and to be uh, 
you know, to have our families not far away from each other. You know, we were down the, down the block to be able to uh, drive to the rink every day with them, to, to hang out in the locker room, to have those bus trips with them. So Jamie's been, he's, he's been one of my great friends in the, uh, you know, that I've, that I've met through hockey. And we still talk um, to this day. We talk quite a bit. Um, Jamie, Jamie's a, number one, he was, he was a really, really talented goaltender goaltender that uh you know was athletic he was he was a smart goaltender he could he could he could read the game very well and i think when he when he went in, over to europe he even started to read it even better so it was it was it was fun to watch him you know in his from the time he was young and to see his development you know all the way through germany and then uh you know now recently uh, we we both have kids that play youth hockey and um, obviously Tyson now plays for the Blades and, you know, I have a son who's uh, at the University of Minnesota now, so we've always kept in touch and, you know, Jamie, I would, I would kind of compare him to a, uh, kind of a, kind of like a surgeon, you know, when a surgeon goes into surgery, they got to read the MRIs, they got to look at different things, they got to, you know, they got to kind of, you know, anticipate what might go wrong with a, with a, you know, a surgery or whatever. And, and that's how Jamie kind of puts his practices together. That's how he puts his system. He's well thought out. He loves the game. He, uh, he knows systems. He knows he wants to always constantly learn to, to find ways to get the players better. He has a great development uh, model that's going on in Oakville right now. And it's, uh, it's, one, of those, uh, it's one of those programs I, I, I believe that kids are really lucky to be part of. And, and, and absolutely. I mean, I've been there for now, excuse me, my fourth season. And just as the, the broadcaster, right, you can see the, uh, the atmosphere that's it's, it's involved. And Jamie wants to get these kids to the next level. And that's what uh, he's been doing so far. So that's the great thing. I have a question for you, obviously, here as we keep on going on on the show. Do you remember the date, February 27th, 1996? the infamous trade <laughs> when you were involved yeah. in the uh, Wayne Gretzky trade. Let's talk about that a little. Yeah, no, it was, uh, I, I remember I was in a, in my apartment in St. Louis and it was later at night and uh, all of a sudden I got a call from, and, and we had, we had heard that there were rumors that, um, you know, that there could possibly be a trade. So nobody know who, nobody knew who was involved. So all of a sudden I get a call. It's um, it's Mike Keenan, and he just said, hey, we made a trade, and I'd like to thank you for everything you did for the St. Louis Blues, and I wish you the best of luck, and that was, that was it, and I, all of a sudden, I got another call from, the, um, from one of the information guys at St. Louis, and they're like, well, you got to pack up your, your flights tomorrow morning, so at that time, I was, I was single, and I was living in St. Louis, so I, I packed up, and you know, I was, I was on a plane the next morning and I, I played that night in, in LA. And, you know, when you, when you look back at it, yeah, you, you understand that it was, it wasn't myself for Gretzky. It wasn't, it was, it was draft picks. It was multiple players. And I remember having a, there was a, a press conference right when we got there and somebody asked about filling the shoes. And I, I just said, if we put all our shoes together, we wouldn't even get close to you know, filling Wayne Gretzky's. But, um, you know, when you, I, I look back on it, it's, it's something that I'll always be, you know, part of that history. And it's, uh, it's something that, uh, you know, I think people look at and my kids look at and, you know, it's, it's kind of a neat thing too. Yeah. When I was, uh, when I was, I was speaking to Jamie a little bit, uh, Jamie store earlier yesterday and, um, I was, I was talking and I was like, okay, there's gotta be, I, I swear I, you know, Craig Johnson, he's, he was involved in something. He was involved in something. And obviously the Gretzky trade. And then I brought it up and then he almost had like a light bulb go off and say, Oh, that that's right. He was involved in that. Cause it was so long ago, definitely something like historical in the league, right. To be involved with uh, so anything with Wayne Gretzky, to be completely honest. Yeah. I, I thought you were going to ask me about my, uh, about the first goal I ever scored at Kiel center. I thought that's what that that's that was what you that was coming next. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> Don't worry, I'm on the ball here, CJ. I'm on the ball. Let's talk about the first goal, right? Like, you know, kids and everyone want to dream about playing in the NHL. Never mind scoring in the NHL. Um, how was that for you? 
I, I remember my first goal. Obviously, it's a dream just to play in the NHL, but to get your first goal, I, I had scored it in my actually my first game, and we were in Vancouver. And, you know, that was that was quite an honor. And then to go back into St. Louis, and we had our first game at the Kiel Center, and this is, this is what we were playing Los Angeles, actually. And a young Jamie Storr was in net, and he'll... <laughs> I can I can pretend I came down and snapped it uh, top shelf, but I, I kind of fumbled the puck. It was a two on one, and I kind of fanned on it, and it ended up going in. So, <laughs> so that was the first goal against the in the Kiel Center, and it was it was against Jamie. So that's uh, that's something I'll uh, I'll always hold on. I guess Jamie right now. That's in that's to me that's crazy how the hockey world can just like wrap around in full circle sometimes um moving moving forward with the uh with your coaching as well you coach i believe the anaheim junior ducks or uh and and did and how how is that and uh other than being you know kind of behind the scenes and the player development and all that do you do you love being uh on the bench as well yeah, I, I was I was really lucky in that I, I got to coach both my kids through their uh, youth hockey. My my oldest one started a little later. He started as a Bantam, but my uh, my younger one I started at as as you know basically his might age, and we mm-hmm. we worked with him all the way through. I worked with him and you know kids his age all the way through, all the way till uh, sixteen triple A, which was a few years ago, and. It was, it was to me, it was one of the best experience I could ever have, you know, just being around my kids, being able to help shape them and, and the other kids, you know, that, that were part of our program too. Um, I, I think coaching in general, it's, it's, it's one of those influential positions that I think you really have to take seriously because you, you make a huge impact in these people's lives, either positive or negative. And, I think coaches have to have to make sure that they understand this and that they they work every day to try to make it a great experience for everybody. But my my years in you know coaching my son and coaching those teams, it was it was it was every day I went to the rink. I, I absolutely loved it, and we had we had successful teams. We had players that moved on um, out of our teams. I, I can't remember the exact number, but. Uh, I want to say nine kids ended up getting uh, Division One scholarships. Um, we had two kids that were drafted in the first round of the uh, NHL draft. So coming from California and you know small little you know hockey hub, and to have two first rounders out of that birth year was was pretty special. And obviously, your son Ryan drafted first round to the uh, Buffalo Sabers, and he went to the same university as yourself. That's got to be a somewhat cool thing that, you know, what you're going through almost in a way, Ryan is going through the same thing. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, he, he's a, he's a defenseman. So it's yeah. been a, it's been a little bit of a, uh, you know, <laughs> a little different path as, as far as him, you know, in the path he's taken in hockey. Um, there, there were a lot of people that, uh, that were, you know, that, we coached with, or I coached with, uh, with the junior ducks. One of them was Scott Niedemeyer. Um, we had another guy, Mitch Lane. We, we had, um, Brian Sotherby who helped out. So we had a lot of people that have, have been very influential in, in these, these kids careers as well. Um, people who, you know, whether it's, whether it's little tidbits of information, insight, whatever it is that have helped all these kids grow. And that's the neat thing that in, in California, there are a lot of uh, former NHLers that are that are in youth hockey with their kids, or you know they might just be in youth hockey as well. But um, it's really lucky for these kids. I, I remember our old one team. We played uh, we played the Junior Kings, and on on the one bench was Rob Blake, Nelson Emerson, and Pat Brisson. Wow! So on our bench we had uh, myself and uh, Scott Niedemeyer. Wow. So we're, we're looking at, you know, all the, all the NHL players and the games and, you know, it's, it's really lucky for these kids to have, you know, coaches that have, uh, that have done it and played. And, you know, you look at Scott who played, who's in the hall of fame, Rob Blake, who's in the hall of fame, and then Nelson Emerson, who had a great career and Pat Brisson, obviously, who, who not only was a great hockey player, but now he's representing some of the best hockey players in the world. So, 
so it was it was kind of a neat neat thing to have here um like looking back at youth hockey i was i was lucky too that i did get to play in europe i think the last year i was in salzburg um it kind of changed my mindset on, on development you know i had i had come from the babcocks and the pat quinns and you know, different coaches in the NHL and you kind of see how they run it and you think, well, this is kind of how it has to be. But then going over to Europe, you saw a different development path. You saw what they did because Salzburg had the, the academy and they had younger teams and everything. And I'd watch and I'd watch their practices and how they worked with the kids and different things and how they how they developed it. And it wasn't just NHL practices and going up and down. It was more, uh, it was, it was skill-based. There was a lot of... Uh, giving the game back to the player, letting the player kind of figure it out through trial and error, through small area games, through different things that, um, that those coaches had developed. So when I came back to the U S I, I kind of, uh, I got right into coaching with my, with my son and we just, we just went right into that development path. And, you know, it was even before the ADM came out, I, I kind of used the Swedish ABCs and I kind of, combine it with some Finnish and some Czech. And so we, uh, and, and we did that all the way through. And I, I think, I think the program itself that we, that we put together for the kids, it, it did pay off as we did have a lot of kids that moved on to higher levels of hockey. You know, what's hilarious, CJ, I literally had my next question written down. Let's talk about the coaches in Europe with Salzburg and what translated your work <laughs> to the USA <laughs> hockey grassroots. And you basically, just touched upon it all right there on what you learned and your coaches and, and what you brought to USA hockey. Yeah. I, I, you know, USA hockey has done a really good job in, in trying to um, trying to, and it is very hard for them because the, the United States is so big and you know, we have so many clubs and, and there are clubs that want to do it their own way or coaches that want to do it their own way, but you can see the benefits. They're not doing it because, you know, this is, they have egos or whatever. They, they've seen the benefits in other countries. You know, you see the skill level coming out of Europe. You see these small countries that are, you know, that are putting up huge, you know, <laughs> number one, they're winning a lot. Yeah. Number two, they're putting a lot of players in the NHL. But when you look at Sweden, when you look at Finland and you look at, you know, how they, how they, they develop the player, but they also develop the person. And that's, that's kind of the biggest thing that I, I took away is that you're, you're not just developing hockey players, you're developing the next doctor, the next teacher, the next, uh, could be the next politician, who knows, but, but yeah. everything is, everything is about, um, you know, more of the kid. And you want to get, you want to put them into positions. And I played baseball when I was a kid and I remember sitting there some days and it was boring as can be because, you know, you had nine guys out, you had one ball, but when you can put people in and give them more reps, it becomes more fun. And you actually, you know, it's proven that you become a better hockey player too, or a better baseball player. And absolutely. And I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, listen, CJ, a, for, a lot of uh, former NHLers, current NHLers and, and I know you, your connection with uh, Jamie Storr and obviously your great friends to this day from your NHL and from your Europe hockey days. Sometimes uh, guys like yourself don't give um, guys like myself an opportunity and a chance to speak to you guys as players and kids want to move to the next level. Obviously, so do I and my dream is to be a uh, broadcaster from the NHL. So I want to thank you very much for uh, taking your time and uh, to talk to me and uh, enhance my uh, new show that I uh, – of uh, breaking through. So I appreciate it very much. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. All right, everybody. That's a former NHLer Craig Johnson for five NHL teams and a few years in Europe as well, obviously in the USA Olympic hockey and so much more. I appreciate CJ. Thank you for uh, joining me once again. Episode number nine will be on the way very, very shortly as this was Mamma Mia. This is Fire Talk. I'm Nicholas Fiore, the Blades play-by-play -play broadcaster, and obviously in this episode, joined by former NHLer for 10 seasons, Craig Johnson. Thank you for tuning in. We'll catch you on the next one. Mamma mia! Hits it in. A chance here can develop, but the Blades will look to take it, and, is, and rip it. Fires Israels. Breakaway Israels. A chance. Backhand. Rebound. Goal! Go!
Garvey to Josh Belgrade. Into the zone, Belgrade, Wyatt Allen. These two had some history from Sunday. Blades are in, Chor the shot, SCORES! Luke, ch 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 He's in and makes the game 3-1 for the Oakville Blades. A little spin of Down low in front of Colton, it's Mamma Mia, what a goal! Game is opening up in a big way for both teams. Ricketts, centering, what a pack, Israel's breakaway, the move, SCORES! What a goal for the Alaska Fairbanks commit! The assistant captain, Harrison Israels, with an absolute dandy, slid from right to left and had Colton Eats' legs pop wide open. Now a lot of Lions, Jack Lyons centering, SCORES! The double jacks combine as the, that puck popped up like a jack in a box, and it's Jack Ricketts from Jack Lyons. That was Mamma Mia! This is Fire Talk with Nicholas Fiore. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for the next episode.